The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Ready to be delivered? All right. Now here's a couple of verses of scripture we've been sharing again and again, and I'm doing it on purpose. Uh, it's the the one from the One New Man Bible, uh, Bill Morford, friend of ours, and when he did the study on the double I am's, I am, I am. There's 30 some in the in the scriptures, and it's for emphasis. Truly, truly, verily, verily. All right. But the one that I want to really zero in on is there were three that had a significant emphasis. And that was, I am, I am your deliverer, and no one can deliver you besides me. Some translations will say Savior, but it's the same thing. I am, I am, and I'm saying this with an emphasis. I want you to really pay attention. Nobody can deliver you or save you but me. It kind of wipes out the many roads to God theory. I am, I am, and I'm saying this with an emphasis, the one that forgives your sins, and I am, I am, the one who comforts you. All other comforts are false comforts. You do it to yourself. You might eat comfort food, but that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? It might feel really good, but there's only one comforter, and that's the Holy Spirit. And then he tells us that as we get filled with the Holy Spirit and walk in the Spirit, that we can comfort other people with the same comfort that we were comforted. That's the real thing. And you can't give something to somebody you don't have, all right? But uh, today we're going to deal with, I want uh, this to be a deliverance service, and uh, you know, we have a book that I highly, we highly recommend, uh, Self-Deliverance Made Simple, and uh, there's a corresponding workbook with it. Uh, I'm always amused. Uh, you know, people say, don't read comments by people on Facebook or whatever, or on your book reviews or whatever. Uh, I know actors and actresses don't like to read their own reviews because you get people that have nothing better to do than to complain, and there's more likely to complain than say good things, right? But anyway... Uh, one guy wrote a uh, comment on our book, uh, Self-Deliverance Made Simple. He goes, I don't think self can deliver anybody. Okay, you need to understand new creation reality. You really need the simple understanding of spirit, soul, and body, and that the new creation is you that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. When you use the word self-deliverance, I am, I am the only one that can deliver you. We are assuming that it's Jesus in you as the deliverer, all right? So without getting into any further ado on, on self-deliverance, uh, <laughs> you want to get delivered from yourself, you need the Jesus in you to do it, right? You cooperate, what have you. But I, I, we're getting really good reports on this message the first time we gave it. So now I'm going to give some uh, other illustrations, but we're going to actually have a deliverance service here. And it is self-deliverance, meaning if you're born again, spirit-filled, you've got the deliverer living in you. I want to show you how to do this. You can't go to a meeting looking for a deliverance minister all the time. You really need to have your own relationship with God and learn how to rely on the deliverer in you to do the work. For it is God who is at work to will and to do according to his good pleasure, which requires that new creation, you, to cooperate. So it's a co-laboring. It's a, it's a joining. It's the real you. And I really want to, uh, we're going to get some deliverance here on false personalities and uh, lies that are even demonically inspired and attached to you and many Christians don't deal with it because they say, that's the way I am. What a perfect ruse by the enemy. That's, I mean, that's a perfect setup is, well, that's the way I am. No, transformation is the name of the game. Jesus wants to change you and rearrange and make you the person he called you to be from the very beginning. You were born an original. You want to 
You don't want to die a copy of something, and you certainly don't want to take on a personality that's opposite of the new creation. It comes against the new creation. So I'm going to lay this out for those watching because we always have, uh, uh, we're getting people to deliver from the first message from on emails because there's hundreds of people outside of this room that will hear it on video. And if they will apply the steps and go slow and just you and Jesus, you will get the deliverance. And we'll even show you how to know if you did or not. Okay. So first of all, dealing with lies. This is what really what we're going to be dealing with. To get deliverance from a, a false personality, uh, we need to recognize, and we've said this ag again and again, there's always somebody new, oh, I didn't hear that part. Everything you hear in your head, words, every word has a corresponding power behind the word. It could be the world, the flesh, the devil, or God. You understand what I'm saying? There's a line of authority with everything you hear in your head, good or bad. If you hear it in your head, there is either flesh, words, wisdom of the world, which is not wisdom at all, demonic, world, flesh, the past. I mean, these are all voices that have an authority. And if you're going to truly see who you are and how glorious uh, you are, and how beautiful you are in the sight of God. As a matter of fact, that's going to be our prayer before we even get into the deliverance part. Is, oh, Lord, show each and every person here how beautiful they were in your mind's eye. Not their eyes. In your mind's eye before they were even formed in their mother's womb. Let's just pause on that for a minute. Lord, I want a glimpse of the, my uniqueness. I was a one of a kind. There never was another me. There never will be another me. But you saw me fused together with Jesus. You saw me before I was formed in my mother's womb. You saw how you made me and the purposes that you made for me and the desires and, and all of the giftings and workings and my total uniqueness was formed together, knit together in my mother's womb. And you saw me and how beautiful I was. That beauty, that reality, that's the real me that I want to see emerge in the days ahead. I want to get back into image. I was created in the image of God. I want to get back into image if I've marred that image with lies. Okay? So, if we're going to deal with lies, you got to realize that... <clears throat> uh, the good place to start is let's release people from the false perceptions or the images that we have of them. You want to be set free? We start with forgiveness. Lord, I release forgiveness uh, to flow out to whoever, whosoever pops into my mind that I've judged as far as not living up to their image, the image that I created for them, not necessarily what God created. I release forgiveness because they're God's servants, not mine. Uh, they're responsible to him, not to me. And that can set you free, to be set free for yourselves. Start by releasing demands and expectations on other people. Not only am I releasing them, mother, father, friends, husbands, wives, children, I release the demands and expectations for them to live up to my image, my standard any standard other than Jesus, any standard other than Jesus is a bad standard. It's a crooked stick. You can't measure people by your own impressions, your own uh, imagination. As a matter of fact, part of dealing with a stronghold is to cast down imaginations, fantasies, things that you projected on other people of the way you think they should be or could be. And you might be right, but nonetheless, that's not your job. Your job is to deal with the reality of who you are and who they are, and you release forgiveness to them. Now, forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. And Victoria knows that, right? right? She teaches that in her small group. There's a confusion between releasing forgiveness and reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two people. Forgiveness only takes one people. Jesus on the cross didn't demand reconciliation. He simply said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He released forgiveness to them. Who responds? 
That's really their will. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. We're going to break a spirit of control here right off the bat and uh, get set free. If you feel something lifting off you and feeling lighter, guess what? That's deliverance for a Christian. It doesn't have to be demonstrative and dramatic. You don't have to name names. But I've prayed for 45 years. I've prayed with people. And when they've dealt with certain issues and repented and forgave, they felt something lift off. It should be that easy for someone who has a deep, intimate relationship with God. It shouldn't be hard. However, you need to release yourself before we go any further. I'm God's servant, not my own. Oh, 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 I'm not general manager of the universe, even though I campaign every now and then. I am not general manager of my universe. I am God's servant, not mine. I belong to him and not to me. So I'm surrendering myself to him to do a work of deliverance. And, and one of the most important things for understanding uh, the deliverance is that when a lie is believed to be truth, it becomes a mental stronghold. A false personality is not just a lie that's believed. Now, I want you to hear this part. It becomes a counterfeit identity. The per- person doesn't just say, I believe a lie, I am the lie. That's when you own it. That's why deliverance is so necessary, even for a believer, because you've owned things that either you or other people have said about you that is contrary to what God says. So right there, that should tell you, deal with it. Don't. Some people never get ministry Christians have been in the church for years and years. They never get ministry on this because they say, that's the way I am. It takes on a life of its own. And you identify with it, even if it's a shortcoming, a dysfunction of sorts. If it's not the real you, let's get rid of it today. huh? And the Holy Spirit is more than willing to show you. This is not mysterious, like, oh, I can't think of it. You close your eyes, and I'll tell you what, God wants you free so to such a degree, it'll flash in your mind. Now, the point will be, don't argue with it. It's an argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And if you argue with an argument, you lose. You lose. Because you need the, the, the delivering power of the Lord Jesus. So... Uh, a person believes they are the lie. They don't just believe a lie. They become the lie. All right. Now we know what we're talking about. Identity. And we're going to get deliverance. It takes, um, and it really seems believable. You know, why would a, a, a lie about your personal identity become so believable? Is because you will have a track record to prove it. Come on. Some of you need set free from even something as simple as I'm stupid. Teacher could have called you that, a parent could have called you, a brother or sister could have called you that. And it had nothing to do with your IQ or your ability. You owned it. And just think how easy it would be for the devil. Anytime you did something stupid, and we all do something stupid. I had a friend that used to act stupid all the time, and he says, I just do that as a cover so that when I do something really stupid, they'll just say, oh, he's just acting stupid. So (laughs) you don't want to own that kind of a thing, all right? God didn't say, oh, I'm going to make billions of people. Then I've got to make some stupid ones. Uh, really, I'm never going to amount to anything because, yeah, I, I, that's my plan. Not, never amount to anything, yeah. Does that sound redemptive to you? Does that sound like something God would do? No. All right, so a false personality takes on a life of its own. But the, the difficult part is, and this is what I want you to do, say, God, he's talking about me right now. And if you're watching by video, uh, He's talking about me right now. They don't receive ministry or even seek ministry on this. And they don't even choose to argue against it because they say, that's me. Isn't that something? And you know, some of the people that we saw set free from debilitating demonic influence, oppression, you know what phrase they used once they started getting free? That's not me. What a beautiful guard, because what, what, what's happening when you say something as simple as, that's not me? What you're doing is you're making a distinction. And what people have a tendency to do, if there's a, a demonic hitchhiker on your personality, I'll tell you what, 
you you had to receive it. You had to give it place or give it ground. But when you say, that's not me, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. Oh, you're stupid. Then. That ain't, that is, that's not God. So I'm not taking it in. I may have done something stupid, but I am not stupid. I am not going to make it my identity. It's a voice, yes. It's coming against a new creation, me. So this is real important that you get the difference between a lie and thinking you are the lie. Both need to be dealt with, obviously. All right. So this false personality takes a life of its own, and that's why some people never go to get ministry or never argue against it, because that's the way I am. That's just the way I am. How many former alcoholics and drug addicts always say they're going to change? You know, they're always going to change. But you know what? It's like you need to release forgiveness to them, pray for them, but reconciliation isn't until there is change because it takes two people to, to reconcile. Reconciliation and forgiveness are not the same. One person can forgive. It takes two to reconcile. Now, the new creation and the real you. When you were born again, you became a new creation. Your human spirit joined together with his spirit, and you became one. So in this church, when we say you, we're talking about the new creation you, the one that's fused together with Jesus, the one that's empowered by the grace of God, which is God's ability that works in you, for it is God who is at work. A lot of people in the church hear the word you, and it's like, apart from him, you can do nothing. That's the independent you. We don't... We don't believe in an independent you. We believe that we're fused together as a born-again new creation. The last thing we want to do is be independent of him. <laughs> all right? So apart from him, that you can do nothing. But I can do all things. Now what you are we talking there? If I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, then I'm coming into the real me, the new creation me that's joined to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> When the, you're joined to the Lord, it's clear in Romans 8. Uh, beautiful, beautiful thing that uh, Jennifer did when we were traveling church to church. She did a, a, a little study on the predestines. And there's four in the New Testament that stand out. And it just lays out the beauty of your life. You were predestined to be conformed to his image. And that's what we're talking about. You're predestined to walk and function. You are predestined to be a partaker of that divine nature. You are predestined to bring many sons to glory. But you can't give something to somebody that you yourself don't have. All right? And I know I repeat that a lot because it's important. You, you can have all this information in your head and have very little spiritual reality. We want spiritual reality because right now, uh, even the church is being hijacked by culture. Culture. Matter of fact, everyone in, in, in our church, anyway, our, uh, all the leadership team for sure, have learned all the words that culture is hijacking. All right. When the world says, see, they like to use emotional words like love. But we say the only one that should be defining love. All oh, those two, two adulterers, they love each other. Okay. No. Love should be defined by God, who is love, and he's the only one that should define love, and he's holy love. They redefine marriage. They're redefining love. They're redefining a bigot. I was a bigot already this morning. I said, there's no other savior other than Jesus. Equality. Equality does not mean equal outcome. I mean, that's the way they're using it, though. Equal outcome. No, equality is everybody's got an opportunity to succeed or to fail. Maybe you'll make it, maybe you won't, you know. But that's, that's freedom, and that's equality, equal opportunity. Equal outcome is communism, it's socialism, it's, it's trying to conform you to the culture rather than being conformed by the will of God. You know the most beautiful thing about being conformed to Jesus as opposed to letting culture dictate? Is the creativity of the human spirit rises you, you get creative ideas. You can't, in a confined, 
communistic society, they, you, your, your, any creativity you have is squelched. The only creativity that might come out is ways to survive, ways to get food. That kind of, but other than that, there's nothing, there's nothing that's benefiting the rest of the world. The great love commandment is to love God and love others. And free enterprise even flows in that. I'm off on a tangent now, but I think it's important for somebody to hear that. Free enterprise flows out of the creativity of the human spirit. I love that example Jennifer used a long time ago about uh, here's the way free enterprise could work for an average Christian. You could see a man uh, with arthritic hands, and he can't button his shirt. And you say, oh, God, heal that man or... Or, but there's lots of people with, with that condition, with that arthritic, and they can't button. Ah, I think I've got an idea. I'm going to create snaps. Yep, that's what I'm going to call them, snaps. <laughs> All right? And as I create these snaps, I'm making an investment to provide for myself, like a business. I'm providing for myself and my family and making these snaps. But it's what's it doing? That creativity is going to bless other people. And then that's um, <clears throat> Adam Smith said, then the invisible hand of, of comp, uh, competition emerges. And someone goes, yeah, you can help people, but not everybody can afford snaps. I could make those snaps cheaper and better. And you know what? I can do it. And then there's competition. More people get blessed. More people can have opportunity to receive from that free enterprise. Communism, socialism is the opposite of that. They only have one pie and it's only so big and everybody gets a piece until it runs out. Creativity says, oh, you know that black gushy stuff that comes out of the ground that gets in the way and makes everything sticky? We found a way to make that become a lubricant and an oil and we've turned it into gasoline we've turned we can oh wow creativity is a product of the human spirit not just the mind because the mind has to be ruled by a force and if the force is mere survival or lack of any kind of wanting to do anything you will just diminish all of the potential to be and to do all that God called you to be, all that called you to do. Again, the definition of grace that is not heard in the church, um, when when given a study across the just across the denominational lines, people were asked to give a definition of grace. The average person said unmerited favor, and that is the one of that's true, but it's one of the weakest understandings of grace. Unmerited favor is what was given to you as a gift. You got saved by grace through faith. It was a gift. But grace is the empowerment. And unless you can come up with a definition of empowerment, you're missing the boat. All right? Empowerment is Jesus. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. And that's going to happen today. As soon as we get to the deliverance part, then you can be all that he called you to be and do all that he called you to do. All right. So uh, the concept that we're going to do now, and we're going to unmask the lies. Something's going to trigger, drop down to your spirit and listen, listen with your, with your head, but open your heart and see if something triggers. Because if you get a trigger here, you're going to need to be set free from it. A trigger means there's a minor reaction to the phrase. If there's a minor reaction to the phrase, guess what? You got it. <laughs> All right? All right. There's a whole list. Just close your eyes right now. And if you're watching by video, just close your eyes and listen. And see if you hear this in your head on a regular basis. I am a bad person. If you knew the real me, you would reject me. 
I must wear a mask so that people won't know how horrible I am and reject me. My identity, identity is I am a shameful person. I'm ashamed. This is who I am. Everything's my fault. I'm the blame. I've got so many issues that I'll never be able to overcome them. Here's a common one. I'm trapped. For the believer, there's no such thing, but you can believe it. I am trapped, helpless, and hopeless. Bad things always happen to me. I can never do enough. I ought to be able to be and do more. I'm valuable because of what I do, not who I am. If I do something wrong, I will be rejected by others or I will reject myself. I do not have the right to exist. Prayed through a lot of people with that one. I do not have a right to exist. My existence is a burden to other people. I'm on the outside looking in, in life. I never feel like I belong. Shameful things have happened to me because I'm bad. I'm guilty. I must work hard to prove that I am worthy of love and that I'm a good person. but I can never do enough, so that will happen. I'm a victim because of people and circumstances in my life. It's all their fault. I'm just a victim. It's all those people and circumstances. I'm damaged goods. I will always bear the burden of inadequacy. I am spiritually inferior and inadequate. That's the perfect trap for not using your gifts, by the way. I am spiritually inferior and inadequate. I will keep you from even trying. I am a disappointment to others and or God. I hate myself. Here's one I've run across a number of times. If I give up my self-hatred and shame, it will only make me proud, which is nothing more than false humility. Okay. Before we pray, here's two things, two definitions we need to understand. Guilt is orientated when we're guilty it's orientated toward behavior like i did something wrong what we want to deal with is more shame shame is being hopelessly flawed i feel different less valuable shame says there's something wrong with me the person it's not just the action that's guilt. Shame. We want to break that right now. The first deliverance that I got in my young Christian life was shame. And I felt that spirit lift off of me. And so there's an anointing for that one. I was a bedwetter. And I was so ashamed. I kept, I kept that as my secret. I was like nine years old. And I didn't want my friends to know that I was nine years old and still wet the bed occasionally. And Yet after I get saved many years later, one of the first things God showed me was I took in shame. I took it and I owned it like I'm ashamed of me. I ain't telling anybody, but I'm still ashamed of me. You own it as an identity. And it can be anything. It can be anything, even silly things. But if you owned it, it's on you. 
And if it's on you, it's coming off because we're exposing it right now in this service. Father, in the name of Jesus, show me the lie. Show me when it came in. When did this start? And if you hear the phrase in your head, like in, in my case, I saw myself hating myself as a little kid. I received forgiveness for self-hatred. We're unmasking the deceiver now. We're unmasking the false personality. I receive forgiveness down in the gut. I am receiving forgiveness from the forgiver who lives in me. I am receiving that loving forgiveness. Now it just changed to peace. Peace means there was a supernatural transaction. Shame, we command you to lift in Jesus' name. You cannot stay. That's not me. Shame. And in some cases, it not only changes to peace, but I could feel the joy as people get set free. In the gut, you'll actually feel like for the first time, a replacement of joy where there was shame. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that we, we released ourselves from that shame. That's not me. Let's go back on any of those, I'm a bad person, I'm trapped, I'm helpless, any of those things that you've dealt with. We're going to deal with them again, all right? Pick one that you've heard in your head, and we're going to show you how to bring down a mental stronghold, a lie that's an intrusive thought uh, that's repetitive, uh, something that periodically you hear it again and again doesn't totally go away. Uh, It's always connected to a negative emotion. So first thing you would do, the first step you do is that thought. I'm going to take that thought, which is how we're going to take it captive and give it to Jesus. Too many people start renouncing almost instantly. Renouncing, if it doesn't have the authority behind it, isn't going to work. So don't renounce until you've broken the authority behind it. I receive forgiveness. I repent for having given it power in my life. Once that changes to peace, you've got the rule of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule. You've got his authority now. I receive forgiveness for taking in that lie until I get peace. From that place of peace, I renounce that lie, that whatever, that I'm trapped, that I'm a shameful person, whatever. Because it, it gets started at the time of emotional wounding. If it's a repetitive lie, you ask God, where did that come in? Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 is clear. Beware lest a bitter root spring up in you, causing you trouble and even defiling others. The sad part about bitterness in the heart, you can actually push other people to sin against you because it's in a, in a sense in an unhealthy demonic way you're asking for it so if you're always a victim uh, question to see what, what what are you pushing if you're the victim what are you what's emanating from you you see this is this is the word that we do on Tuesday nights we have to learn that we emanate you can fool people with your words you can fool them with your body language. And for, for the most part, a lot of Christians don't really have very good discernment. What they do is they use body language <laughs> and the words. Well, you can fool people with your words and you can fool them with body language, but you can't hide what emanates. In other words, you're a fragrance of something and it's perceptible. There's times when you cultivate your spiritual senses, you can discern what's coming from somebody even when they're not talking. 
I can remember a real troubled girl. Wouldn't say she was the height of spirituality, but she would come in. Uh, she was in my pastorate up in Pennsylvania. She would come and she'd say, Pastor, can I stand by you before the service starts? Because when I stand by you, I can feel your peace and it makes me feel peaceful. She didn't have her own peace. She was actually feeling peace that was coming from someone else. But you know what? That's better than nothing, right? So she would stand there. And I'm saying, you know what? She's getting an education. No, she's acclimating to what she can have for herself, but she doesn't have it yet. So you can fool people with your words. You can fool them with your gestures, but you cannot hide what you emanate. And discerning people actually who have had their senses exercised to discern more often than not are almost embarrassed at how obvious a Christian can be because they think they're hiding it behind a smile, they're hiding it behind not talking, the silence treatment, or they're hiding it behind hyper activity and bubbliness. Even had a person once, they needed a healing, and they said, well, people like people that are bubbly, but not if it's fake. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understood what they meant, but it's still, that's not the real thing. You need the reality of Jesus and the new creation to be expressed through you. That was God's will and intent. Any facsimile thereof is fake. It's a false personality and demonic at worst. Fake at best, <laughs> demonic at worst. And more often than not, if you own it, oh, you've got a demonic hitchhiker with it every time because it fortifies it. It's not just a lie in the brain. It's fortified. And it will be fortified by the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every time you, like you say, I'm a mistake. Every time you make a mistake, you're going to hear that. To fortify it as, it must be true. It must be true. And that's another word that even right now the culture is hijacked, truth. Jesus said, I am the reality. I am the truth. Right now, culture is hijacking truth as there's your truth, there's my truth, there's other people's truth. Let's all be respectful of everybody's truth. That's not truth. That's kind of a Pontius Pilate philosophical answer. What is truth? You know. Oh, wow, I'm so impressed with your ability to rationalize no truth is jesus truth is the word wherever the word that god says about you is being attacked by the world the flesh and the devil you know there's a uh, there's a scripture in isaiah that i think is happening more now than ever before it said there is a voice there's a voice in the city the noise in the city there's a voice from the temple and there's the voice of god and it really hit me. The voice from the temple or the church may not necessarily be the voice from God, right? You need to be able to make that distinction. Because right now, where culture is trying to change Christians, it's already in the church. It used to be in times past that you were set apart. Isn't it true? You got born again. You went to church to be amongst those of like-mindedness because the world was the opposite. You were called out of the world into... Church is not the safe place anymore. It's like a fifth column in there. And they're redefining the scriptures. I, I, I mean, I can't believe some of the things I'm hearing. It's like, uh, what was that one that we heard? I could only listen to a minute and a half of it. And then I was done. But it was uh, a worship leader who preaches saying, I guess some people could invite Jesus into their heart. I, I guess I'm okay with that. And you're preaching at what church? Uh, you know, let's face it, the Bible's got a lot of problems. That's in church. So if little by little, you know, all the heresies, even in the first century church, all the heresies were to attack the basic tenets, and it's happening today. Jesus is the only way that's being attacked. Virgin birth is being attacked. Everything, uh, uh, even those of you that were raised Catholic, you were, you were, you were taught the Apostles' Creed, right? 
<laughs> all of those issues are being attacked. All of those issues. Well, Jesus really wasn't, you know, to eventually you just you just tear it down to, you know what, your truth, my truth, their truth, let's all be tolerant of everybody's truth. Even if it's stupid. Okay? Well, I could be tolerant of somebody's stupidity because there's always hope for redemption is the name of the game. But that doesn't mean I'm going to say it's true. There's one truth, and it's Jesus. And he proved it. Okay, so I'm going to give you some homework, too, because you're going to have to learn how to do this on your own. How to deal with a repetitive thought. Any goofy thought that happens during the day is not as powerful as a repetitive one. Why? Because a repetitive one means somewhere along the line, you gave it place. You, get, you owned it. You sucked it in. And keep in mind, too, even quality Christians, you can suck something in accidentally. And, and how do you accidentally take in something negative that's contrary to the scriptures? Is you'll have proof right alongside of it to go, mm, there it is. You'll have some kind of a situation that proves that you're like that. All right? But it's always connected to a negative emotion. I want to see people set free. And old time church of jumping right to renouncing. I've seen people try to renounce fear like that. <laughs> I renounce, I renounce that fear. I renounce that fear. Even minor discernment would tell you uh, they still have the fear, but they're saying the right words. <laughs> I renounce the fear. I renounce the fear. The force behind the renouncing has to be coming from the anointing of the living God or it's not going to work. The name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. Didn't they show that in the book of Acts? People tried to use it like it was a rabbit's foot. They weren't saved, but they could say, in the name of Jesus. Whoa, that didn't work well because it needs that recreated human spirit, that new creation, you, the real you, where it is God who is at work to will and to perform by the grace of God the empowerment of God, not just a free gift, not just unmerited favor. It's empowerment to live the Christian life. It's the ability to obey. It's the power to obey. Where does that power to obey come from? Your will, yes, but a will has to be yielded to his will. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do. Why do we not see that? Why do we try to do for God when it's really the God in you that does the work? Surrender is a more important aspect of Christian living than trying harder. As a matter of fact, TRY, acronym, T-R-Y, temporarily resist yielding. <laughs> drudgery. If you see a Christian brother or sister living in drudgery, I promise you they're trying. But you know what? You don't get points for trying. You need to trust. Always, always, a mental stronghold is connected to a negative emotion. If you do not deal with the negative, every thought has a corresponding emotion. What was it? We were just reading somebody, some neuroscientist or something was saying, you will never, you will never change your thinking. The emotion will take over. If the emotion doesn't change, your thinking isn't going to change. The emotion will override. I know there are three bad kids, mind, will, and emotions. But those emotions, if they're not dealt with, they are the motor behind the clutch and the steering wheel of where you're going. That's usually the better example. Steering wheel is the mind, and it's usually all over the place. All right? The clutch is the will, and you engage. But where's the power source, the motor? It's the emotion. If you do not know how to deal with the emotion, you can say all the right answers till the cows come home and not see the transformation because transformation, the Greek word is N-O-U-S, nous. And that's mind, will, and emotions. And you go to any good old evangelical Bible school and they say you cannot repent unless it's mental, volitional, and emotional. But sometimes it stops there, and then they tell you, don't live your life by any feelings. Pay, don't pay attention to feelings. 
You just got saying that true repentance requires all three. Why wouldn't a walk in the Spirit require cultivating all three and let the peace of God rule in your life? Why would you say, why would you overemphasize, don't live by your feelings? You're not supposed to live by your carnal feelings, but you may never learn, if you don't know how to deal with those carnal feelings, you may never learn that there is physical feeling, emotional feeling, and there's spiritual feelings. And for the most part, the church has missed out on some of the best spiritual feeling because their discernment has never developed because their carnal emotions are in the way. Every lie, every mental stronghold, every goofy thing you hear in your head has an emotion behind it. And until that emotion has been dealt with through the cross, and how do I know if that emotion was dealt with? Everybody at my church knows. I don't know if everybody watching knows the answer. How do you know? Peace. Peace is the only supernatural way to determine if there was a transaction that was real and spiritual or just saying the right answer. I'm telling you what, saying the right answer is not going to work. You can say the right answer all day long, and then maybe you get lucky by surrendering that toxic emotion and asking, oh God, I can't do this, forgive me. And then it works. <laughs> Why not just do that in the beginning? Every crazy thought has a corresponding emotion. So get started and say, okay, God, I'm seeing a cycle in my life. When did this cycle start? Well, for Dennis, the shame came in age nine. And guess what? All through my life, there were periods where I was ashamed. I walked, I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, had open visions, and when I went to give my testimony, I felt shame and I walked off the stage. So don't tell me it didn't affect my life. <laughs> and then I, that's when I went home and learned how to deal with it. I went, God, I am really messed up. I've had open vision. I'm called to preach. And guess what? When I stood on that stage, I could feel shame to the point where I walked off, the poor worship leader had to give her testimony because people had gathered. There was probably about 40 people there gathered to hear Dennis's testimony, and Dennis walked off the stage. Of course, then you, then you beat yourself up when you go home, all the way home. You, you dummy, why did you do that? What's wrong? I knelt down by the side of the couch and said, God, what's wrong with me? And he showed me where it started. Age nine, you were a bedwetter, and I saw a very vivid picture of myself making clench fists. You... I hate you. You can't even control your own body and you're nine years old. What is wrong with you? And when I said, well, it's wrong. This is a new Christian, right? It's wrong to hate people. I guess it's wrong to hate me too. <laughs> Big revelation, right? I received forgiveness and that thing lifted off me and I saw it. I'm talking vision, real vision. I saw it like a slimy, stocking mask lift off of me and joy flooded it. Now I was kind of an accident going somewhere to happen. I was a baby Christian and <laughs> guess what they did after I walked off the stage? I went to church. The other one was a, a parachurch meeting, but I went to church and guess what they said? Dennis, we would like you to come and give your testimony. And I'm going, like, I just got set free now. I walked off the stage the other day, but now I'm at church, and they're asking me to do the same thing again. I walked up there, and I go, I don't know how to explain this. I, I, I know I'm a new Christian, but I like me. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'll bet they were rolling their eyes going, oh, dear Lord, we got, we, we got a loose cannon here. He likes himself. But it was, I couldn't express the joy that I was special in the sight of God and that he loved me with all of my dysfunctions and everything. Somehow there was an awareness that when he joined together with me, he had the ability to remove all of that dysfunction. And by the way, if you've got dysfunctions, you got that way all by yourself. So even if you blame other people, guess what? You took it. You said, that's me. Yeah, that's me. All right. Well, that's just the way I am. You owned it, right? So, if there's ongoing cycles, you may have historical evidence, but it's unscriptural. And it's not what God or the new creation would say. So, 
you might have a justification. Write down your justifications that you've had. It's one thing to bring that lie down. It's another thing. Write down the justification you have because then when those that same circumstances arise again that you used to say, see, see, now you're going to go, that's not me. You want to you want to see a real deliverance from Christians no matter how long you've been saved? Try that, that's not me, when something goofy goes in your head. I mean, I'd rather you got the root, but if you got the root, Keep in mind that that doesn't mean that those same circumstances don't have a voice and they're going to try to reattach. When they do, all you've got to do is say, that's not me. I got free of that. I'm stupid. I'm not stupid. That's not me. God didn't make me stupid. I've done some stupid things, but when I hear that, I am not owning it. I'm going, but that's not me. I hear that voice. Oh, Dennis, that was stupid. You just did it again. That was stupid. That's twice now. Yeah, but that's not me. But that's not, do you see how therapeutic that could be from a Christian point of view? You're agreeing with the new creation reality more than you're agreeing with the circumstances that are trying to fortify your stupidity. <laughs> so if you believe that, you're stupid. <laughs> no, don't own that. <laughs> you say, that's not me. Doing something stupid and even sinful can produce guilt. Receive forgiveness for guilt. But shame is what I am. You don't want to wear it. You don't. Actually, you know, one of the definitions of repentance is a change of garments. You put off the old, you put on the new. Real repentance is a change of garment. Quit wearing it. We're going to have people really set free in the days ahead. And God's outpouring is going to affect them to where they're not going to... uh, just sit in the corner and enjoy his presence, they're going to be motivated and activated to step out and do what God's called them to do, unafraid, unafraid. This is a time of stepping out of the boat, so to speak. But it would be wise to get rid of this junk before you step out of the boat. Huh? I don't want anybody drowning on my watch. All right. Don't step out of the boat till you dealt with your junk. All right. Now, even if there's historical record that wants to corroborate and bring it up again to you, you say, that's not me. A mental stronghold attracts perpetrators. Ah, but having the same old, same old people in your life? I remember Jennifer. Jennifer was a school psychologist, and she came home one day and was telling me, and I go to different schools. And why is it, out of all the teachers, every school seemed to have this one person? Maybe you've experienced this on a job, in the neighborhood, I don't know. But why is there always this one kind of person? Till one day she went to that school and she had an open vision and it was like translucent bats. And when that woman would come around, it would go. And sure enough, there was confrontation that followed. She was seen it in advance, came home. We prayed about it and said, there's always that person. So what are you really doing though? It's something in Jennifer, but it's pulling perpetrators. I'm not saying those people were right in their confrontation. I'm simply saying it's a repetitive pattern where there's a cause and you can be attracting perpetrators. Abused children can attract people to want to abuse them and they in turn can become abusers unless that's dealt with. And we came home and we prayed. She released forgiveness to that, that same lady. That lady was absolutely, that teacher, totally different the very next day. After you, teacher in middle school, was the root. She said, where did that come in? And there was a teacher in middle school that was the root issue. That's where she gave that place to that kind of teacher, that kind of person. And when she released the forgiveness to the, some middle school teacher, suddenly that lady didn't have the perpetrating effect on you. If there's a same old, same old, 
you know what, you know, there's, there's women that have men problems and men that have women problems. And one of the most beautiful things God can do until you deal with it, a lot of times, is to put you in a situation. Remember that uh, military man? He always had a woman officer until he got healed of it. And then he realized, I had a woman issue. <laughs> and it went back to <laughs> his mother, all right? That can happen. But you can actually draw something to yourself that's not necessarily those people's problem. But you can draw perpetrators to yourself. Remember, a bitter root springs up causes you trouble and defiles others. You, it can push other people to sin. They're responsible for their own sin, but why would you want to be contributing to pushing them to sin? <laughs> you know? You won't get invited to parties, that's for sure. <laughs> and I don't know, it's all the time, you, know. you ever watch a Hallmark movie? There's always an instigator somewhere. But my favorite part of any Hallmark movie is when the two people are trying to get along and they overhear the other person saying something negative, but they didn't, they didn't stick around to hear the rest of the sentence. I've seen that theme once. I've seen it. You can tell I'm a Hallmark expert now. I'm a Hallmark junkie. But it'd be like, oh, I don't know about Dennis. I get wounded and I walk away and then Jennifer says, but he's the love of my life. Well, I didn't hear that part. Huh? That's a typical Hallmark movie, right? They hear, they hear the part that causes doubt, fear, and unbelief and then they walk away all wounded. All right? We're not going to do that here though, all right? All right? So, these activities are intermittent. Okay, that means you've got a root. How do you know if you've got a root? It's what we used to call the same old, same old, if you're hearing it repetitively. All right. It distorts. And here's the way it works. It starts out as a suggestion. Remember what? Just look at Eve in the garden. Did God say? Did God say? It becomes a suggestion which becomes then a distraction. That's how you know it's starting to gain ground in your life. If what you heard in the middle of the night, in the day, when you got up on the, on the road, in school, whatever, at work, if a suggestion starts to distract you, it's gaining power. You give power to what you give attention to. That's when you say, ah, that's not me, I'm not going there. Because a suggestion becomes a distraction and a distraction can eventually dominate your life. You could waste the whole day on something stupid that may or may not even happen. What a wasted life, right? And during that time that you're distracted, that's why let not the sun go down on your anger. You know why that's in the scripture? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It's because it hardwires into long-term memory and then you're going to have to deal with it at a much more difficult position later. And so what I've heard in my ear, I'm going to let be written on the tab of my heart. I'm going to take it and I'm going to apply it in the days ahead. To pray prevenient prayers. In other words, I'm going to pray ahead of the devil. And I'm going to be prepared for an onslaught of voices from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I'm going to be able to say, that's not me. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.